All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning if you're out here in California. Uh, good day if you're in other parts of the world. Uh, welcome into episode two of Biologics Blue Box webinar series. Uh, my name is Arnold Foreman, and I support the western portion of the United States for Biologic from my home in Northern California. Uh, I see a few familiar names in attendance here today, and I, I look forward to getting out to visit everybody again as the pandemic eases and we can visit labs again. Uh, today's presentation will last for about 45 minutes, and it'll be followed by a question and answer section at the end. Um, you can post questions through the GoToMeeting webinar portal uh, you can write your questions in at any time during the webinar, and we will collect those questions and uh, ask the presenter to uh, to answer them at the end. Uh, so with that, it's it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Candice Chan. Candice is an Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the School for Engineering of Matter, Transport, and Energy at Arizona State University. Uh, I've known Candice for about 10 years now, since we met uh, when she was a PhD student at, at Stanford University in Yishui's group. Uh, after that, her graduate, after her graduate work, she went up to uh, Peidong Yang's lab at UC Berkeley uh, before moving down to Arizona State University. Um, since, since her time at Arizona State, she has received an NSF Career Award, Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship, uh, ASU Young Investigator Award and a, a Fulton Exemplar Faculty Award. Candice's research is uh, right at the interface of material science and electrochemistry with a focus on synthesis and evaluation of uh, different engineered nanomaterials to address critical needs in lithium ion batteries, electrochemical energy storage, uh, and some photocatalysis and water treatment work. In today's webinar, Candice will share with us some of her research on tuning the atomic scale structure of silicon-based lithium ion electrodes as a strategy to modulate the electrochemical properties. And with that, I give you Professor Candice Chan. All right, thanks for that intro, Arnold. And um, I'd just like to thank Biologic for organizing um, this webinar series and for giving me the chance to participate in it. So I think it's been a, a really great um, idea and a really great way to reach out to the rest of the the electrochemistry and biologic community. Um, so we all know about lithium ion batteries. They're pretty ubiquitous. I was trying to think of um, devices that don't have lithium ion batteries. Um, it's really hard to think of things that don't really use them anymore. Um, and they're only going to become more ubiquitous in the future. Um, and so we we know that they, they work well. Um, we rely on them. Um, but there's still a lot more to be done. Um, and as we look forward to the future where we're going to have more electric cars um, and where we're going to have higher demands for portable electronics and other small devices, um, we really need to think about uh, what's what's next and what other materials um, we can think of that we can use for the next, next, next generation of batteries. So the battery um, community is very diverse. Um, it's it's really quite interesting, quite fun because if you think of a battery, um, it's it's a pretty simple concept, um, and yet it attracts uh, interest from people from so many different disciplines. Um, and part of this has to has to deal with um, the the really broad um, uh, length scales that are involved, and also really the the all the different types of components that go into making this device work. So um, I think. Uh, if you have a science or engineering background, you can understand how the battery works, but even if you don't, it's still a very important device for your everyday life. So um, in my group, we've been uh, really focused more on this um, uh, basic science level. So we've been looking at the materials chemistry problems, um, but we also work with other groups that look at more of the applied, um, applied aspects. Um, and this is something where um, these sort of collaborations can be really fruitful. So before I go into more detail about the, the main topic of the webinar, I just want to give you um, kind of a, a hint of some of the things that are going, the other things that are going on in my group, so not just the, the silicon um, anode 
project. Um, so we have uh, been doing some work on understanding how we can design foldable and flexible batteries. Um, and so part of this is uh, finding material solutions. Um, so in this case, we've developed foldable current collectors um, using uh, carbon nanotube coated papers, those flexible substrates. And here we can see uh, it's kind of an in situ measurement uh, investigating how the properties of this paper change as we apply mechanical deformation. Um, working with other engineers in electrical engineering, we were also part of designing stretchable interconnects um, and understanding how these materials um, change their electronic properties and how we can integrate them with foldable batteries, as well as also looking at um, the, the right types of uh, packaging materials that can allow a uh, uh, battery that's undergoing really extreme cases of deformation to remain um, uh, robust and prevent ingress of water and, and oxygen into the cell. Um, so I've also uh, been involved in development of um, novel liquid electrolytes uh, with my colleague, the great and unfortunately late Austin Angel. Um, and so if you guys know Austin, you know he has done a lot of work on um, really pioneering work in the electrolyte space. Um, and so we've been interested and we're continuing on this work um, on understanding how we can develop new electrolytes using eutectic uh, mixtures that can allow us to uh, obtain a very uh, wide temperature range stability. Um, and so we've been setting not only the properties of these liquid electrolytes um, and identifying the thermal properties, but also how they cycle in cells. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, we are uh, very interested in the materials chemistry of novel materials. So we've done some work on looking at polyanionic materials for cathodes, uh, both for sodium and lithium ion batteries. So this is a, a work from a few years ago. Um, and more recently, we've been doing a lot of work on solid state ceramic electrolytes. Uh, we've been focusing on, on the garnet um, type electrolytes and uh, looking at ways to uh, develop new synthetic methods that can allow us to access um, different morphologies um, and also uh, using different precursors that can allow us to access different microstructures in the centered materials. Um, so now going back to the main topic um, of today's webinar, um, this is um, a topic that we've been working on for a while. We've been lucky enough to get um, support from the National Science Foundation for several years. Um, and this uh, this project has been uh, a collaboration uh, between ASU um, and the University of Delaware. So um, my co-PIs are Shi Hong Peng, who is also from ASU in the physics program, and then Svilin Bobev, who's a solid state chemist from the University of Delaware. And as shown in the central, central graphic, what we're interested in um, is a, um, a really combined approach um, to look at um, the potential of clathrate materials as novel uh, lithium battery um, anode materials. Uh, I'll explain a little bit what these clathrates are, but we have uh, a combined approach involving uh, evaluation of the electrochemical properties using uh, electroanalytical methods, uh, which my group has led, um, and I will actually be talking about this project today. Also, rational material synthesis uh, led by Svillin's group, um, but we've also contributed by uh, developing some new ways to make these materials using electrochemical methods. Um, and then structural elucidation. Um, and so this has been very important because if we want to understand the structure property relationships of new materials, we need to have really good structural characterization. And so we've used a combined approach of single crystal, X-ray diffraction, synchrotron methods, um, and pair distribution function to look at the local structure of phases that might not be crystalline. And this has allowed us to uh, gain a lot of new insights on the relationship between the structure of the material and its uh, lithiation properties. And finally, the last leg of it that's very important is a computational model modeling so we can understand how lithium uh, and other ions can diffuse into these uh, novel structures. So we can use um, density functional theory to look at the potential lithium sites and also how lithium can move around within the structures. So uh, if we go take a step back, um, if we look at the, uh, the, the general schematic of the lithium ion battery, um, so for, for the longest time, the lithium battery um, has stored lithium ions uh, within these layered structures in the cathode and anode. So we have uh, lithium cobalt oxide and we have graphite, and the lithium storage mechanism is really in between the, the layered sheets of these materials. 
Um, and so as as our demands have increased and we needed we've um, needed higher energy storage materials, um, as a field, we've been looking at other other alternatives. Um, so if we look at the potential uh, anode or negative electrode materials, we can see graphite here has a low uh, specific capacity, and we have several other materials that can can yield higher capacities. So one of the um, most popular materials is silicon. And if we look at uh, some of the, the properties of silicon compared to graphite, um, so this is a table um, comparing um, the actual uh, properties you might get with graphite versus the theoretical ones you would get if you were to lithiate silicon and form this um, equilibrium phase. And this actually is not what happens when you lithiate silicon at room temperature. Um, so in room temperature, you form an amorphous lithium silicide, and the per percent volume change is uh, around 300 percent. But we can see that um, on paper, this looks really, um, really exciting. We can get much higher capacities and energy densities when we switch from using graphite to silicon. Um, but really, the caveat has been you get a large volume expansion. And the result of that is that if you have silicon particles and you uh, lithiate them, because of this large volume expansion, the particles um, can undergo very large stresses and pulverize. Um, then some of the particles, because they've broken into smaller particles, they lose contact with the conducting additive and the electrode, um, and you start to um, lose your active material. At the same time, um, now we've increased the surface area because the particles have pulverized. Um, that can lead to increased porosity, and you can have um, unwanted side reactions with the electrolyte. So ultimately, this results in um, really poor cyclability. So um, these issues are uh, really fundamental to uh, the materials chemistry of conventional silicon. So this uh, high volume change in the, um, the mechanical stresses, those can be somewhat uh, mitigated with engineering solutions. Um, and that's actually what a lot of the research efforts have focused on in the last um, few years, actually since my PhD. Um, so this is um, my work from my PhD, where we looked at using nanostructuring um, to um, have uh, control of the stresses that are generated in the material. Um, this is just one strategy. There have been numerous other ones since then that are um, not as difficult to do and uh, easier to scale up than using nanowires. Um, and then these other uh, panels here um, are not my work. I just decided to highlight them because they have um, nice pictures. Um, but uh, other than morphology control, we, um, there's also been extensive efforts on creating composites of silicon with carbon or even silicon oxide with carbon um, to try to mitigate some of the um, some of the uh, bad phase transformations. Um, also improved surface uh, coatings or novel electrolytes directly targeting silicon electrodes so that you can um, try to mitigate some of the, the unwanted electrolyte de decomposition. Um, and then finally, there's been uh, so much work on improved binders and some binders that are even, even self-healing so that even if you have um, the silicon particles become um, pulverizing, the binder is uh, resilient enough um, to, to hold everything together. So these are all engineering solutions, um, and there's been so much progress, uh, and um, silicon has, has been um, successfully uh, turning up in, in numerous um, batteries in industry, um, ranging from startups to even established um, battery companies. Um, and so, so the question is, okay, so some of these fundamental materials chemistry problems have been addressed with these engineering solutions. So, um, so what's next? Um, so uh, in our group, we've always been very interested in looking at um, novel materials and trying to understand their fundamental materials chemistry issues. And so one of the questions we had was, well, we know silicon um, is in general a great material, um, but silicon that we're used to with the diamond cubic structure, it has these fundamental materials chemistry problems. So what if we looked at silicon with a different atomic structure? Uh, what kind of electrochemical properties will we get? What kind of mechanical stresses might be generated in the material? And would this uh, take us along a different path where we, we might have a, a fundamentally different material? All right. So uh, the, 
the type of silicon um, that we've been looking at um, has a structure that's called a clathrate structure. And this is not um, solely dedicated to, to silicon. Actually, there are many materials that also adopt this clathrate structure. So uh, the word clathrate uh, really means a, a cage structure. And you may have heard it from the context of methane clathrates. Um, so fun fact, clathrates were actually first discovered by Michael Faraday. So as electrochemist, we all know who he is. Um, so it's really interesting that he was also the first one to discover this clathrate structure. So in, in his case, what he found was that chlorine molecules could, this is actually methane in this picture, but chlorine, chlorine uh, gas molecules um, could be encapsulated within um, a cage structure comprising um, hydrogen bonded uh, liquid uh, water molecules at very low temperatures so that they were um, actually forming uh, a cage of ice around the molecule. So um, nowadays we know that there's a lot of clathrates in the oceans comprising methane. Um, and here's a picture of the methane clathrate being burned. And this is what it looks like. So um, there are many, many other uh, molecules uh, that can form clathrate structures, so not just these gas molecules, but you can imagine why this sort of structure might be interesting. So what if, instead of we had water as a cage, what if we had an inorganic solid material, and what if instead of putting a gas molecule inside, we actually put um, ions that we can storage and use for energy storage purposes? So it turns out that um, there is a class of materials um, called the, that we call the tetraclathrates. So tetral is referring to the, the fourth group in the periodic table, the fourth column. And so there are clathrates that um, where the framework is actually made up of silicon, germanium, and tin covalently bonded together. Um, and so um, these have mostly been looked at in the past. Uh, as superconducting materials. Some of these have magnetic properties. Um, the silicon ones, of course, um, have interesting optoelectronic properties. Um, and uh, the really interesting thing about these materials is they come in several different types, where type is really referring to um, the geometry of the different cages and how many of them are stuck together. And they also come with many different guest atoms. Um, and so there's a whole slew of them. You can also have substitutions on the framework or some other materials replacing the tetral element. And um, what we wanted to understand was this is such a very different structure compared to diamond cubic silicon. Um, and for the most part, these materials have just been synthesized with these guest atoms in there. And you'll notice lithium is not one of these. So uh, we want to know, well, can we electrochemically put lithium inside these cage structures and use these as energy storage materials? Uh, where would lithium go? And what happens to the clathrate structure once we've put lithium in there? And through these studies, um, these insights can um, give us better, better inf information on understanding um, how lithium um, is stable inside new types of structures so that this can allow us to design, uh, give us design rules to design better structures. Um, and also um, in all of these studies, we've been comparing the lithiation processes in these novel clathrate structures to the conventional diamond cubic, um, or in, in the case of tin, um, beta tin materials. So we've done work in all, all three systems, sil silicon, germanium, tin. Uh, because of time, I will only focus on one of the silicon systems, um, but we have uh, many more publications um, in this area if you're interested. Okay, so the, the silicon clathrate system I'm gonna talk about is uh, of the type two. And what the type two clathrate structure means is that um, it's made up of two different types of cages. One is um, a silicon 28 cluster. So there's 28 silicons in this in this cage. And then there's a smaller cluster of silicon 20. And so you can see there's eight of the larger ones, 16 of the smaller ones in a single unit cell. So it turns out that um, the sodium filled clathrate is one of the, the, the easiest to synthesize. Um, and the synthesis is, is quite straightforward. Um, it is kind of air sensitive and reactive. So um, please be careful if you wanna do it. Uh, we detail all the safety protocols in our publication, but it basically starts with a, a zintel um, compound, the sodium silicide, which you can prepare uh, just by mixing sodium metal and silicon. And um, it's a simple thermal decomposition where you can control the temperature and the pressure to um, not only 
make sure you get a pure phase of this type 2 clathrate, but you can also control how much sodium is actually inside. So this particular material has a very tunable sodium content from 24, which is the maximum, where each one of the cages has a single sodium atom in the center of it. Um, and then if you uh, play around with the pressure, you can actually um, remove the sodium so you can get um, the cages to be empty and free of gas atoms. Um, and so um, this is um, a picture of the sodium that's been evaporated out of the system. And so the clathrate material will just end up in the middle of the furnace once this um, zintel precursor has decomposed. So these particles um, are pretty micron sized um, from the synthesis. Uh, they're nanocrystalline, but you can see the particles are pretty, pretty large. Um, and so when we're looking at the electrochemical properties of these, we're not doing nanostructuring or anything. Um, really, everything that we're, we're doing is looking at um, the bulk structure and how changes at the atomic scale um, affect the properties of the material. So this is a nice model system, as I said before, because you can change the amount of sodium inside uh, the material. And what that can do is by getting rid of the sodium, that's creating more space for lithium. So um, in, in the study, we uh, synthesized two different sodium content materials. So the first one here, um, we have about 11 sodiums um, per uh, unit cell. So the unit cell has 136 silicon. And what this means is that these larger cages are um, full with sodium. Um, because in this particular material, if you don't have all the cages filled, if you only have them partially filled, the sodium atoms will want to go into the large cages first. Um, so we have only eight large cages and we have about 11 sodium. So uh, we know that these large cages are, are filled with sodium. That means lithium is not going to um, be able to go in there. Then on the other end, um, by really um, controlling the, the sodium vapor pressure, we can get rid of um, almost all of the sodium. Um, and so this is, even though there's still a little bit, maybe one sodium, uh, we call this nearly gas-free clathrate. So this will give us an idea of how, um, what happens when you have these cages complete or almost completely empty, uh, where will lithium go and what kind of properties would you, would you see in that case? So before we talk about the electrochemical properties of the clathrate, um, I thought it would be important to, to kind of um, highlight the properties of conventional diamond cubic silicon or alpha silicon, um, which, is, um, which is what's being investigated and now as a silicon anode, um, and also amorphous silicon, which has also been investigated in, in, uh, extensively in the past. So <clears throat> this is a typical voltage profile you would see if you're lithiating um, diamond cubic silicon um, in a half cell. With lithium metal as the counter electrode. And so you would typically see a very nice plateau where um, you have a two phase reaction where the alpha silicon uh, is reacting with lithium and then um, forms an amorphous lithium silicide that grows um, as at the expense of the unreacted initial um, alpha silicon. So um, these uh, sort of voltage curves are very useful, um, but I personally really like the differential capacity curves, which um, I, I can just say I really like the EC Lab software from Biologic because um, making these plots is really, really simple and really convenient. Um, and so these plots are really useful because we can get a really, really good um, idea of the potential dependence of the electrochemical reactions. Um, and as you'll see, uh, we, we use these plots a lot to really identify uh, the potentials at which different processes occur and use this to um, understand uh, the lithiation processes. So for diamond cubic silicon, uh, we have this two-phase region at about 0.1 volts. For amorphous silicon, um, the lithium insertion process can be described more like a solid solution or single-phase process. And so we have, uh, instead of uh, a single potential process is spread out because the composition is changing um, and we have two two different um, amorphous phases with different local structures. So we can see there's big differences between uh, diamond cubic and amorphous silicon um, and then just to be complete um, at these low potentials um, this process um, occurs where the um, the lithiated silicide actually recrystallizes into this crystalline 15, lithium 15 silicon four phase. Um, so that's not so super important to our, our uh, discussion today because we're more interested in what happens um, 
before that. Okay, so now we have the voltage curves of our, our two clap rates with our two different sodium contents. So the black one here, uh, remember that one is almost completely free of sodium, and the red one here has sodium inside those bigger cages. And so we can already see that there's something quite different between them. So we have um, a little plateau here, and then we can see the voltages are, are different. So these uh, differential capacity plots, as I mentioned, are very useful for us because we can uh, clearly see uh, the differences between um, the, the materials and the potentials at which the processes are happening. So this little plateau at about 0.3 volts shows up as a very sharp peak here. And if we integrate the charge and um, find an equivalent capacity um, and composition of, if we ignore the sodium in there, uh, the equivalent composition is shown here. Um, then we have an, another process here at 0.25, and then um, down here, that's also the crystallization of the lithium-15 silicon-4 phase. So a couple interesting things. So this little plateau corresponding to this process here, we don't observe it in the clathrate that has sodium in the larger silicon-28 cages. So that's a hint that that sodium is preventing a process. Um, and then also this composition. Um, so because there are only 24 cages inside the unit cell, um, if we have one lithium going inside each cage, then that corresponds to this composition. So we only uh, can expect uh, lithium-24, silicon-136. Um, so since we're getting something higher, um, that might suggest that there are multiple lithium inside a cage. Um, so this is interesting and something that uh, we want to investigate further. Another observation is that if we attribute both of these processes to an amorphization reaction, which we did confirm using X-ray diffraction, um, that these are occurring at different potentials. Um, and so uh, we can see that there is a, a composition dependency on when these uh, processes happen, where really the only difference here is the amount of sodium in the starting material. Okay, and then as I mentioned before, at low potentials we get this process, but that's not really uh, relevant to, to our story. So going back to uh, what's happening in, in this plateau right here. So we wanted to um, get more information. So we um, took a sample and we lithiated it and stopped it right after that flow uh, plateau. Um, so this is a, a different sample than the one before. So it had a slightly lower capacity and lower lithium content. But um, using synchrotron X-ray diffraction, we were able to um, get, get a, a structure. Um, and my collaborator, at, at the University of Delaware um, did, did a, a pretty neat analysis. Um, so if you, if you take the, the information from the diffraction pattern and you um, subtract out the framework, so the silicon clathrate framework, without any gas atoms, um, you can look to see where there might be some residual electron density. Um, and that electron density uh, might indicate the presence of um, ions, guest atoms that have been inserted electrochemically. Um, and so that's what these little red blobs are showing. And you can see that they are not symmetric. Um, and the refinement results actually identified uh, a couple really interesting things. So first of all, after this process where we inserted lithium, the volume expansion was very, very low, only about 2%. Uh, the refinement that gave the best fit indicated that we have um, almost 11 lithium within the silicon-20 cages. Um, and then really more interesting is we also have almost 11 lithium within the larger cages, and there's only eight of those. So this really implies that we might have multiple lithium inside the larger cages. Um, and so these are the sites. So here in um, the light blue are the potential sites for the lithium. And because the material is not fully sodium-free, if there's a sodium atom, it would prefer to be in the middle. So uh, this refined composition uh, was really interesting for a number of reasons, because um, we previously it was not understood if it was possible to put lithium inside the cage when there's already sodium in there. And more, moreover, this also implies that we could have more than one lithium inside a single cage. So that was the, the structure that was um, identified with the X-ray diffraction data. Uh, we also wanted to confirm this using um, computational uh, studies. So with density functional theory, uh, we 
try to identify the potential sites that lithium could reside in the clathrate structure. And we didn't do um, we didn't do a cluster expansion analysis where we consider all the sites. We just thought rationally. Um, so logically, you would expect, based on the structure, that you could have a site in the center of either cage, as you can see in the animation here. Um, the larger cage, the silicon 28 cage, is large enough that you can also have uh, sites where lithium is not centered, but they're off-centered. And so in this larger cage, we have uh, two types of faces. So we can see here, here's a hexagonal face, and here's a pentagonal face. And the lithium in light blue can be, um, can be positioned off-center, um, either in the pentagonal face or the hexagonal face. Um, so these were the, the sites that we considered as the most uh, feasible. And based on the energies calculated from the density functional theory, uh, we can see that um, having a single lithium in, inside the center of the smaller cage is pretty favorable, but it's not very favorable in the center of the larger cage. And this has to um, this deals with the fact that the large cage just has a huge volume. The lithium atom is very very small, and it's uh, destabilized. So it would actually rather be closer to the sidewalls of the cage, off of the um, hexagonal face. Um, so based on, on this data, um, if we're going to put lithium inside this clathrate structure, um, the lithium would most likely go inside the smaller silicon 20 cages in the center or off of the hex hexagonal faces in the larger cages. And I know um, from this image, it, it looks like it's off a pentagonal face, but it's just the, the aspect, um, the, the viewing point of the structure. Um, so that's great, but if these are the sites that the lithium will want to go into, um, how how does lithium actually move within the structure? So uh, we wanted to un better understand how lithium diffuses around between these different sites. And so for this, um, we perform uh, nudge elastic band uh, calculations to try to identify these uh, migration energy barriers. And so first, if we look at a single large cage, um, so as I showed you in the previous slide, we have multiple sites inside the cage where the lithium can sit. Um, it can be off of the hexagonal face, and the hexagon is down here, so you can't see it, we're looking edge on, um, or off of a pentagonal face. And this is actually a pretty low um, energy process. So the cage is big enough that the lithium is pretty happy to diffuse around it along the walls. Um, and then if we have two cages um, that are both silicon 28 cages, they are connected with a hexagonal face. And we're looking edge on here, so you can't see it, but this is a hexagon. And so we have two uh, sites off of that hexagonal face. And for lithium to go from one to the other, it's also a fairly low energy process. And so we can see this movie movie here. So, so that that's great. But if we look at the entire crystal structure of the material, we don't just have the silicon 28 cages. So the silicon 28 cages, they form a network. It's actually a, a tetrahedral network. Um, and each of these cages is connected by a hexagonal face. But uh, the other cages, the smaller cages shown here in orange, uh, these silicon 20 cages are connected uh, via a pentagonal face. So while it's Pretty, a pretty low energy process for lithium to go through the silicon 28 cages. Based on the electrochemical information that we got and the capacities that we measured, we know that there has to be more lithium um, going into uh, the smaller cages as well. So how, how does that work? How would that actually work? Um, so because these two cages are, are connected with the pentagonal phase, um, we wanted to see what happens when we um, have lithium diffusing through the center of that pentagonal phase. And it turns out that this is a very high energy process. So if lithium goes through uh, the center of the pentagon, um, there's not enough space for it. And so um, it causes a lot of distortion. So we can see from this movie here, here the pentagon is, we're looking edge on, um, but you can kind of see the amount of movement that uh, results uh, with the silicon atoms moving out of the way. So this process um, is 2 eV, um, and that's quite a high energy barrier, so that's probably not feasible. Um, and compare, especially compared to when lithium is going through the hexagonal phase. 
So this is unlikely. Um, so there must be some other, other mechanism. So rather than forcing the lithium to go through the Pentagon like this in the, in the very center, we thought, well, what if it kind of moves off to the side? Um, and so if going through the center is not favorable, if it moves off to the side, um, and it turns out that this is actually energetically feasible, provided there is another lithium atom close by. So how that works is that if we look at this picture over here, so the light blue is this, the lithium, um, and it's trying to go through this pentagonal face here. And um, going through the very center is a high energy process. But if it goes a little bit off to the side, and goes in between where you have two silicon atoms bonded. So these are just colored in black just to highlight their importance. So we can see that this silicon-silicon bond increases dramatically to the point where you can almost consider it being broken. Um, so it increases to let the lithium go through. And then once it's gone into its final resting spot inside the silicon 20 cage, then it contracts and reforms. So this, this process where this silicon silicon bond is so large that it's broken is actually stabilized by the presence of another lithium atom close by. So if you have a lithium atom in the neighboring cage, then this process um, is actually um, energetically feasible. And so you can see from this from the animation um, how this might work um, and unfortunately this is not something we've uh, been able to um, observe experimentally through with uh, operando measurements yet but hopefully we can do that sometime in the future so <clears throat> um, so i just said this um, that this is a, a a different pathway we could call it a cooperative mechanism because we have more than one lithium involved where the other lithium helps to stabilize the transition state but importantly what it does it allows um, the energy barrier for the lithium to go from the larger cage to the smaller cage to be decreased so if we look at that process um, this is what the energy um, uh, barrier looks like so going from the large cage um, the energy increases as we break that silicon silicon bond right here then um, we have a decrease and then finally it goes into this silicon 20 cage at the end and so you can see that this is not a symmetric path um, so it's um, because it's the energy is lower inside the smaller cage um, if we think about lithium going in and out the energy barriers are asymmetric and this is something that uh, we should be able to see in electrochemistry if this is happening so just to summarize, um, we in this clathrate structure, we have a number of different geometric considerations. So lithium going through silicon bonded in a hexagonal structure is, is pretty low energy. Um, if we want to maintain a perfect pentagonal structure, it's not, it's very high energy. But we can see that there are other options where you can have uh, reversible um, uh, distortions in the structure. Okay. So if this is what's happening, this is the proposed mechanism. So here we have a, a cutout of the structure, and um, these are the silicon 20 cages, and then here are the silicon 28 cages, these black tetrahedral, tetrahedrally connected um, pathways. And so what we think is going on is that um, lithium is first going through the silicon 28 um, network so this is kind of like a, a highway for lithium and then once lithium is going through this network then it can branch off and go inside uh, the silicon 20 cages so these are like when you're exit ex exiting the highway um, and so uh, we think that this works um, via this bond breaking mechanism um, but because it is asymmetric then we might expect to see um, some asymmetry in the electrochemistry Okay, so what do we see in electrochemistry? Turns out we do see some interesting things that um, might support this mechanism that we saw with the DFT calculations. So here we have um, we have the the guest-free, nearly guest-free um, silicon clathrate, and this is just um, zooming in and looking at the the galvanostatic voltage profile. Um, and one of the things that we notice right away, um, and again having these um, differential capacity plots is really useful. Um, if we look at uh, the first cycle, so here as we're decreasing the potential, we're adding lithium into the system, um, and then we uh, are delithiating going back up here. This peak right here with that little star is quite unusual um, because usually you will see the potential increasing as you're moving lithium from the material. 
But the fact that we have a peak means it's uh, the potential is decreasing a little bit as we are removing lithium. That's not that's not typical. Um, and so this little peak is manifested by this little loop-de-loop -loop thing here in the differential capacity plot. Um, and it, it is a reproducible and reversible process. We see it in subsequent cycles. Um, and uh, if we play around with the voltages, so how low we go in potential as we're lithiating the material, we can see we can um, affect the, the, the features in the differential capacity plot. So we've um, kind of identified the processes uh, by the letters as shown here. So whatever is going on in process B and C are connected. So we have lithiation, delithiation, and then process A and D and E are connected. So if we change the potential so that we don't access process B, we don't see process C or this interesting peak. So based on the number of lithium that we um, are seeing being inserted and removed, we think these processes are related to uh, some of the, the asymmetric processes that I just discussed about in the previous slide. So we have, we know that we have, um, first we know we have two distinct processes where we have lithium going into the two different types of cages, and that there's also uh, different pathways for that to happen, um, depending on, um, and, and different energetics depending on uh, what's going on. So another interesting thing that we've found um, is that by doing um, galvanostatic intermittent measurements, um, we can get a sense of um, the, the polarization in the electrodes. And one of the interesting things that we found is that um, if we look at the hysteresis, it's very, very low. Um, so only about 10 millivolts. And that is a, a usually a good indication that you have a topotactic uh, insertion reaction. So this is a, the type of hysteresis you'd see in lithium cobalt oxide, for example. Um, we can also see that there's some high polarization during the delithiation process. And this may be related to that higher energy, uh, asymmetric energy barrier and being slightly higher as we're taking lithium out. Um, so um, this is still kind of speculative, but um, the DFT and the electrochemistry results um, seem to be consistent with each other. Um, and we, um, we think this is a really interesting um, and um, new type of process that has not been seen in diamond cubic silicon or other um, materials that we would know of. Okay, so a lot of people want to know about cycling behavior. Um, and I have to say that one of the issues with this material is that the amorphization reaction um, occurs at a potential that is too close to this really interesting topotactic reaction. So this uh, topotactic insertion reaction is at uh, about 0.3 to about 0.26 volts versus lithium. Amorphization starts below 0.25. So what we find is that we have to um, use really careful voltage control. But even if we use a 0.26 volt cutoff, we still see some evidence that some of the material is amorphizing, um, as shown by these curves here. So we have to use a higher potential to really make sure that we're not allowing any of the material to undergo that reaction. Um, and the drawback is that this creates um, a material that has a, a pretty low capacity uh, compared, to, compared to graphite and compared to what you'd expect for diamond cubic silicon. Um, but we know that um, this amorphization reaction is not taking place throughout the entire material. So X-ray diffraction analysis afterwards with these two voltage cutoffs show that um, most of the material is still crystalline. Um, but this is something that unfortunately seems to be um, a pretty basic materials property um, because uh, of where the potential between the insertion and the amorphization reaction um, takes place is, is not really something that we can see, we can control. Um, and then an, another thing that I just wanted to comment on is that the Coulomb efficiencies, um, so they're pretty low in the beginning, which is um, can be understood from the fact that the electrolyte that we've used in this case is, is not tailored for silicon or even for the clathrates. And we've done some other work in the past where we looked at the surface passivation properties of silicon clathrates using uh, scanning electro scanning electro microscopy scanning electrochemical uh, microscopy methods um, and um, the surface properties are, are really not um, 
as passivating as even diamond cubic silicon. Um, and so this is something that needs more electrolyte development and engin engineering of the interfaces to deal with. But if we um, look at these, um, the basic fundamental materials properties of this material um, and assume that these, um, these technical issues can be solved with um, development of um, engineering solutions, um, then how, how do these materials fare? Um, and it's actually quite interesting. So if we look at this table, um, so here in this column, we have um, uh, the experimentally um, observed composition from our, our, our electrochemical measurements. Um, and so even though the capacity was not, not retained, um, but suppose that we find a way to get the right electrolyte and whatnot, um, we can expect a capacity of around uh, 230 million pounds per gram. Um, the volume expansion that we measured, um, both of the synchrotron X-ray diffraction and also with the DFT calculations is very low, so less than 1%. Um, so we can almost consider this a zero strain material. So if we compare this to another well-known zero strain material, the lithium titanate, we can see that the clath rate has a higher capacity and it has a lower voltage. So LTO we know um, has uh, a pretty high voltage, which results in a hidden energy density. Um, and so if we can um, figure out how to get this to cycle well, this could be um, a higher density alternative to LTO. So we've also looked at um, other forms of the clath rate. Um, and so we've looked to see how much lithium can we actually put in there. Um, and so this is something that we just calculated with DFT. We're not able to uh, realize this experimentally, um, to my knowledge, just because that amorphization reaction just starts so quickly once we um, put more lithium in. But if this were able to be realized experimentally, um, this would be the equivalent capacity. The DFT calculated uh, potential and volume expansion are shown here. Um, and so this could actually be um, a low, lower volume expansion alternative or competitor um, to graphite. So the capacities um, are about similar, um, and the but the volume expansion is much lower. The potential of the clath rate, if um, we could realize it, uh, would be slightly higher, um, but not too high. So just slightly above what you'd see with graphite, which could be interesting um, in terms of uh, mitigating some of the safety issues with the very, very low potentials close to lithium metal. So um, this is just kind of a, a hint of what could be possible um, with some additional work um, and to give people a, a sense of what, what these cloth rates um, might, might be useful for. Um, so this amorphization reaction that I mentioned before, um, because it starts so close to where this lithium insertion process is, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an issue. Um, but one of the things that we were interested in was trying to understand what, what's the nature of the amorphous bases that form in this material as well. So um, this is a, something that we've been looking at uh, fairly recently and using pair distribution function analysis um, to understand the local structure. Um, and I, I won't talk too much about this because um, these uh, PDF graphs just look like a bunch of squiggles for people who aren't um, familiar with it. And so that's something's not very interesting. But basically what we're interested in is um, trying to understand um, uh, the local structure around different atoms and what these amorphous phases resemble. And we can do that with, this, with these PDF, um, PDF measurements. And so we've, we've done that and compared the local structure of the amorphous phase that forms when you overlithiate the clath rate and compared to what you see when you um, lithiate diamond cubic silicon. And what we find um, is that the, the local structure in the clath rate uh, really resembles um, something more like what you'd see in this lithium 12 silicon 7 phase, where we have a lot of clusters of silicon retained. Um, they might be um, in the shape of uh, silicon pentagons or stars. Um, and also this amorphous phase uh, forms at a lower lithium content in the clath rate compared to in the diamond cubic silicon, which is consistent with what I said before. Um, but something that is interesting is that um, the mechanism, if we go back, so what happens down here, and we can see it here. So we see um, the potential is gradually changing um, as the composition of chain is changing, as more lithium is being inserted. So it's really more similar to a solid solution process rather than a two-phase process like you'd see in the diamond cubic silicon. 
Um, and so this is uh, really the, the picture that we've put together based on our, our PDF measurements. So we know that we start with our initial clathrate structure. There is some uh, topotactic insertion in the very beginning. Then once you um, get into this lower potential range where you start to amorphize the structure, um, it breaks apart like this where a lot of the, the silicon um, Silicon bonding is retained um, with a lot of the silicon still in pentagonal and, and star-shaped clusters. And then um, as we continue further, then it breaks apart. So other things that we've looked at, and I won't talk about this too much, is that uh, we've looked at how the effect of sodium um, and also the structure affects the electrochemical properties. Um, and so we have several different um, different compositions we've looked at. <clears throat> and you can clearly see that there is a role in the amount of sodium inside the cages. Um, that's obvious now that we understand how lithium migrates through the bulk structure. Um, if we have some of these cages blocked with the presence of sodium, that's going to prevent the lithium diffusion and promote amorphization. Um, and then this last one, this purple one, this is a, a different type of clathrate. So you can see we have silicon 46 instead of silicon 136. So this one is what we call a type 1 clathrate. The type 1 clathrates have another interesting feature in that um, you can synthesize them where some other element is substituting on the silicon site. So we've looked at um, we've looked at aluminum substituted silicon in this particular system instead of sodium inside the cages. Um, barium is inside the cages is, um, when it's synthesized, and this gives us very different properties from the type two clathrates that I talked to you before. Um, so depending on the amount of aluminum substitution, uh, we get um, different electronic properties in the material, um, and then that also results in very different electrochemical properties. Um, so this is some of our previous work. Um, if you're interested, um, you can ask me about it or um, look at the papers. Um, and so I just wanted to finish off and summarize uh, um, the, the topic. So in the type two clathrate, with a very small sodium content, content so nearly gas-free, um, the, the key feature that we see is that it is possible to have topotactic reverse, reversible lithium insertion. Um, and this is, this is quite unique. Um, that's not something you would expect to see in diamond cubic silicon. Um, and it really is um, a result of this really unique structure where we have um, these available silicon 28 cages that act as these lithium highways for um, lithium to go in and then eventually fill out the rest of um, the rest of the sites inside the material. Um, and so one of the takeaways from this work though is that we also know that the silicon highway and having silicon in these hexagonal faces, um, oh, sorry, the lithium highway um, and migration through these silicon hexagonal faces um, is a really uh, low energy process and could be really important for enabling bulk <clears throat> diffusion through a silicon based material. So as, as um, material scientists and chemists find more and more different forms of silicon and germanium, these sort of features might be very important for uh, finding materials that can allow um, really fast lithium diffusion. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I just want to um, end by acknowledging my coworkers. Uh, so uh, the work um, that I presented today was really led by my PhD student Andrew Dopilka and Amanda Childs from University of Delaware. Um, Svillin um, and his postdoc Alex really helped a lot with the structural analysis, and then Shi Hong helped with the the DFT. And this is just a picture of us at uh, the Diamond Light Source getting the XRD and PDF measurements. And this was actually our last trip before COVID hit. This is the, the end of January 2020. Um, so I really want to thank um, all the beamline scientists that helped us um, at Diamond, Desi, and Argon uh, for all the, the characterization work that we use in this project. Um, and if you're interested, um, the article um, is in a, 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 the article related to this work is uh, online. It's available open access. So if you are interested, uh, here's the citation. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to email me, um, and um, I'm happy to, to take any questions now as well. Thank you, Candice. Uh, very nice presentation. I, I really like to see uh, 
good theory work merged with good experimental work. And I, I think you did a very nice job of that and a very good interpretation of all of that information. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, a reminder to the audience, feel free to enter any questions in the chat, uh, sorry, not in the chat, in the, in the questions part, portion of the, the sidebar here on the, the GoToMeeting webinar. Uh, but to, to get us started, uh, so you've done a lot of analytical work here. Uh, we were wondering if you've done any NMR work or thought about doing any NMR work to, to you know, kind of look at the positions of your, your lithiums within these structures. Yeah, so we we have done some in the past. Um, I I think it's it's a complementary technique. Um, so I think in this case, because we've been very interested in um, also the amorphous phases, um, the PDF just looked like a, a more appropriate technique. Um, but um, it's not. I mean, I wouldn't exclude that. It's just something that I happened to learn while I was on sabbatical, and I just wanted to apply it um, to, to the set of materials. Right, right. Uh, so there, the, the clathrate that you started with is a silicon-based clathrate. It was, was there a, a reason to choose silicon clathrates as opposed to a different uh, type of clathrate? It, is it something related to conductivity or, or non-reactivity or something with the lithium? Yeah, so even though this is really basic, basic research, um, you know, we still have to be motivated by potential applications. And from all the all the different types of clathrates available, silicon is the lightest weight. Um, so the especially the type two clathrates that I talked about today, because you can synthesize them um, with sodium, which is pretty lightweight, and then you can remove the sodium so that's almost completely just silicon. Um, that is um, the most attractive material in terms of gravimetric density. So the germanium ones that we've looked at, you have to synthesize them with barium. Barium is really heavy. You can't remove the barium afterwards. Um, we've also looked at tin. Tin is even heavier. And there are other clathrates, um, you know, phosphide-based and other materials that I think just from a gravimetric perspective, um, they're just not as interesting. So we just wanted to start with something that um, if they cycled well and had interesting properties, they might be more applicable to a real application. Right, for sure, yeah. Uh, and then what about the other cations? So you've worked with sodium, and, and that seems to have some uh, synergistic effect, perhaps, with uh, being able to put more lithiums into the, the, the cage. Do you think that there are other effects that you know are yet to be discovered here with, with other cations? Yeah, so we, we've tried to electrochemically put sodium in some of the materials. And we also um, have a DFT study where we looked at sodium diffusion. Um, it actually, it's not as good as lithium as you might imagine because it's it's um, it's bigger. Um, so the thing with these clathrates is that the, the host and guest relationship is very important. So um, the size of the cage versus the size of the guest atom um, is really important um, and how how the guest atom will migrate through these different phases. Um, and so just based on what we've looked at, um, there, there are some of, some combinations are promising and some are not. Um, and it just has to do with the geometry. So that said, um, I think because uh, not a lot of people in the solid state chemistry community have been thinking about these sort of problems, even though these materials don't exist yet, doesn't mean that they can't be synthesized. So part of what we've been hoping to do is kind of highlight some of the potential benefits that you might have with these materials and hopefully encourage other people to, to look at um, new, new combinations of materials that might not have been synthesized before. Um, so yeah, there might be an optimized composition that will allow sodium to diffuse through the clathrate structure really, really well, but that just doesn't exist yet. All right, all right, great. Well, thank you very much, Candice. Uh, so we're, we're just right at the time here, one minute past uh, 10 o'clock local here in California. So uh, I wanna make sure to, to close the seminar here uh, to, to allow everybody to continue on with their schedule. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the, again, the, the second episode of the, the Blue Box webinar series, and uh, we'll be announcing the, the third webinar sometime soon. So uh, if you are registered on our uh, our, email, uh, automatic email system, then you should be getting a, an email from us at some point in the next several weeks announcing the next webinar. 
Uh, if you're not registered, uh, please feel free to, to sign up. You can do that through our website. Uh, Candice, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Uh, and thank you in the audience, everybody, for, for joining us this morning. Uh, and everybody stay well. Bye for now. Yep. Bye.